Schwing, Hwing, Kling, Ein, Saum, Ing, Hwing, Schwing, Kae, Ila, Ring, Asaka, Halla, Ring, Saka, La, Ring, Sao, Ein, Kling, Ring, Schwing, Aum. O Bhavani, Sages and saints describe your gross forms as Kali and others. The Vedas speak about your subtle mantra forms, Kamakala Rupa. Poets adore you as the origin of speech, Shabda Brahman. Philosophers think of you as the root of the worlds, Mula Prakriti. But we devotees think of you as the universal ocean of mercy and compassion, Karunarasa Sagara, and nothing else. Namaste. And welcome to the second episode of our new series on the Dasha Mahavidya, the ten forms of the goddess personifying the mystical path to enlightenment. So just to review quickly, the ten goddesses, Dasa Mahavidya, are Kali, Tara, Tripura Sundari, Bhuvaneshwari, Tripura Bhairavi, Chinnamasta, Dhumavati, Bhagalamukhi, Matangi, and Kamalatmika. And again, I want to reiterate that this series is based on the principles of the Tantras, the Tantric scriptures. It's a body of literature, ancient in origin, mostly spoken by Lord Shiva to his consort Shakti, or Bhairavi. And so this large body of ancient Sanskrit scriptures comes down to the present day in the form of the Sri Vidya, the path of the goddess, the knowledge that leads by the feminine path to self-realization. So in this episode, we're going to discuss a little bit about the tantras, the tantric scriptures that illuminate the path to self-realization. Most of the tantras, tantra scriptures, dwell on consciousness. And in fact, they elucidate a very practical and realistic approach to self-realization. Arthur Avalon wrote, Tantra has no notion of some separate far-seeing God. It preaches no such doctrine as that God, the creator, rules the universe from heaven. In the eye of the tantra, the body of the sadhaka is the universe. He further says that Atma Shakti within the body is what is sought for, and it is the personal deity of the sadhaka, often called the Ishta Devata. So, Tantra, although it is a theistic path, also embodies the path of jnana or knowledge. And that means that we see the deities and so forth described in the scriptures as metaphors, as symbols of an ultimate reality that is actually indescribable, inconceivable, and non-cognizable. So this reality is called Brahman. And we understand that Brahman exists within our own body and that these goddesses are actually the cosmic functions that make the appearance of the universe seem real, even though it's actually an illusion. And so by understanding her and how she brings the universe into existence, we actually penetrate to the truth that is already existent within our own self. Not that God is out there somewhere, huh? No, God is in here somewhere. And the 
problem or the purpose of self-realization is to realize the nature of God as pure consciousness. That's why we titled this episode about consciousness, because it is the background and context of the entire tantric path. Unfolding of Atma Shakti is brought about by self-realization or Atma Darshana, which is achieved through persistent practice known as sadhana. Ultimately, the sadhaka understands and realizes that the Atma Shakti and the Supreme Power or Shiva are one and the same. This ultimate knowledge completes one's spiritual journey, at the conclusion of which one becomes liberated, mukta. So the tantric theory is that Shiva, or the unconditioned Brahman, resides in everyone and everything, and that the appearance of forms and of states of consciousness conditioned by those forms are actually Shakti, his power, who is also Maya, or the illusion. So Shiva is covered by the illusion, and that's why the world appears to be real, even though it isn't. Similarly, when we look within, we seem to be in a state of conditioned consciousness. But what is really happening is that the pure Atma, which is Shiva, is covered by Maya in the form of Kundalini. And so when through the practice of sadhana, the Kundalini arises and joins Shiva in the Sahasrara chakra at the top of the head. This brings about an experience called enlightenment or awakening or samadhi or nibbana or whatever you want to call it. That experience is when we realize that the Atma, the apparently individual soul, is actually Shiva, the universal. All the ten Mahavidyas are also known as Brahma Vidya. It is often misunderstood that pursuing any of these Mahavidyas leads to liberation. That is a wrong notion. Every sadhana takes the sadhaka forward towards the highest spiritual attainment, liberation, in successive stages. It is not that one gets liberated immediately on receipt of a mantra from a guru. Sadhana means leading straight to the goal, liberation, and in the process bringing about, carrying out, accomplishing, fulfilling, completing, and perfecting spiritual practices. So it is not that just simply one of these Mahavidyas is enough to attain liberation or enlightenment. No, all of these techniques have to be used in the appropriate ways. And it is not that simply cycling through them once will bring one to liberation, or the initiation by a guru, or the so-called Shaktipat initiation. No, the path of sadhana goes in a spiral, and one goes over and over the same practices at a higher and higher level of awareness until suddenly one day, by the grace of Shakti, the curtain of illusion is removed. She gets out of the way and we can confront Shiva directly. Sadhana is not merely ritualistic worship. Although it begins with ritualistic worship, over a period of time, the sadhaka realizes the fact that the body is the temple and the self within is the sanctum sanctorum. It is said that body is the temple and the jivatman within the body is the self. So we have been over and over again and again the four stages of consciousness and the four stages of sadhana related to them. And this also factors in the chakras and the Four Noble Truths and so many other views of the spiritual path. 
So even though we've presented it so many times, it seems that very few people are actually getting it. So we have to repeatedly emphasize the fact that the self within, self with a capital S, is actually Brahman. There really is no such thing as an individual being. The Jivatman is simply the Paramatman, which is covered over by Maya, and the process of sadhana is to remove that covering of illusion. What is the difference between Jivatman and Paramatman? Paramatman is nirmala, or without impurities, no gunas or attributes, and in fact nothing except purity. Jivatman is that state of Paramatman who is encased, veiled, and covered by his own power known as Maya, which is full of spiritual ignorance. Unless the veil of Maya is removed, Paramatman within cannot be realized. The process of removing the veil of Maya is known as sadhana. What will happen when the veil of Maya is removed? There will be Atma Darshana, or realization of Shiva, which leads to ultimate liberation. So it's not that we're worshiping something outside of ourselves, but rather we're trying to uncover the reality that lies within. So looking within is really the main principle of sadhana. That's why the ritualistic worship is simply preliminary. And this is known as karma yoga. When it reaches its fruition, it transforms into bhakti yoga, which means love of God in whatever form one conceives of. So you can uh, worship a male form, a female form, an animal form. I mean, there are thousands of different forms of God and goddess. It's not the form that's important. It's the principle of looking within and developing love for that source, God. Then, when the higher stage is reached, when bhakti reaches its maturity, meditation arises spontaneously. And through meditation, this covering, this form, name and form, is seen to be illusion. And when that is penetrated, the supreme realization of Atma is there. Tantra Shastras attach more importance to consciousness than to external rules and rituals. The highest consciousness can be attained through the Purusharthas, the fourfold values of human life. They are Dharma, righteousness or virtues, Artha, wish or purpose, Kama, desires and pleasures, and Moksha, liberation. It is clear that the ancient scriptures do not prohibit these great human values. What they say is not to get attached to them. So if you go back and actually study the Vedas, Upanishads, and Vedanta, and so forth, you will not find any rules. These rules and regulations of external ritualistic worship are a human invention and comparatively recent, actually, maybe a thousand or so years old. I mean, the Buddhists, for example, if you're a Buddhist monk, you have 127 precepts and rules to follow. And the, the Buddhist nuns have even more. So try to understand. Rules are created by humans. Principles are created by God and given in the scriptures. So that's why the original source scriptures that everything is based on don't have rules. Instead, they have principles that the Purusharthas, Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha, all four are important. And each one has to be completed in order. That's why there are four stages of human life, brahmachari, grihastha, vanaprastha, and sannyasa. Because in the beginning of life, 
Brahmachari is to learn the dharmas, to learn what is reality, why it is the way it is, and all the scriptural knowledge that leads one to liberation. Then, in Grihastha life, one pursues artha and kama, one's purpose in life and enjoyments and pleasures. There's nothing wrong in this. You know, the religions have sprouted up and made all kinds of rules and are grossly anti-sex in their tone. But still, the, the religious people can't follow them. Look at the scandals in all the religions about the priests having sex and so on like this. It can't be stopped. The cure is to understand our desires and pleasures and find what is at the root of them because that is the Atma, or the Self. This concept is often misquoted and misunderstood. The first three Purusharthas are known as Trivarga. Dharma is not a mere bundle of spiritual dictums, most of which are of post-Vedic origin. Dharma really means the law of nature. What is, the way it is, and why it is the way it is. We have to go along with nature or prakriti. In fact, the trivarga is controlled only by nature. If any overdoing or overindulgence is done, nature interferes and stops further indulgence. And this law of nature is controlled by shakti. As long as the triads are within the law of nature, nothing will go wrong. This is exactly what Tantra Shastras advocate. So in other words, we're not trying to transcend nature. We're not trying to deny nature. We're not trying to suppress nature. All these are artificial and they lead to failure because after all, nature is much stronger than we are. What we're trying to do in Tantra is to understand the law of nature and follow it to its ultimate conclusion. When the Kundalini rises, activating the different levels of chakras and nadis, the energy ultimately reaches the Sahasrara. And when she unites with Shiva, then all the Maya is removed and we see things as they are. And these are the descriptions given in the scriptures and by the realized souls that actually there is nothing but Brahman. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.